Okay, thanks guys. Uh, so uh, I'll start today's webinar uh, right now. So uh, Jeremy speaking here. So for today's agenda, I will be going through quite a lot of things. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the revamped technical pulse that we have just uh, sort of released last Thursday, as well as the constructed, uh, we have constructed a new portfolio based on our technical models, uh, and we named that the Philip 20 portfolio. Uh, and subsequently, we'll be talking about the company results uh, on various companies such as Seng Xiong, Semcorp Marine, DBS, UOB, and IFAS. And last but not least, we'll be covering the sector report on Singapore REIT sector. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll jump straight into today's webinar. So like I mentioned again, uh, this is the revamp technical pulse that we have sort of uh, released last Thursday. And, and within that revamp technical pulse report, uh, we have sort of uh, included more specific calls within our technical pulse, uh, including uh, specific entry levels, take profit levels, as well as stop loss level. And the other important part that we have for this technical pulse is uh, we sort of uh, constructed a new uh, portfolio based on our technical models. Uh, and from that, we sort of uh, created this portfolio term, the Philip 20 portfolio. So this is uh, the 20 component stocks that we have sort of selected based on our technical models. And this is just placed uh, based on alphabetical order. So these are the 20 stocks that we have selected. Again, like I mentioned, based on our technical models. And uh, the name of this portfolio is called the Philip 20 portfolio. And just to give you guys a very brief overview of what's uh, within this portfolio, this is only a long only portfolio. And uh, we sort of, uh, followed these stocks throughout for the past few months and based on our models, we believe that these are the 20 stocks that have room to run in the near future. And to orientate you guys uh, what this table shows, so like I mentioned, this is a long only portfolio and what we have over here and this entry date is the reference date that we sort of uh, took uh, the particular trade based on our most recent updates. So for example, uh, the first particular counter that we sort of uh, chose was China Aviation Oil. Uh, and if you want to take a look into why we sort of created a long trade uh, for China Aviation Oil, uh, you can just refer to the particular column over here on the date and click onto it and that will bring you to the most recent updated uh, report on China Aviation Oil on the rationale behind why we are long China Aviation Oil. And then as well as the entry price, this column of the entry price is based on the uh, entry, entry date that uh, is from this column. So if you want to know more, again, like I mentioned, uh, just click onto the particular entry dates over here to see uh, why we are sort of along uh, the particular counter. As well as the stop loss and take profit levels, uh, these are the updated view based on last Thursday's price. And that will bring us to our targeted return uh, from the entry price as well as take profit level. And the last column over here, which gives us the current gain and loss for respective counters. As you can see over here, these are all based on our entry date over here and as of last Friday the average gain is about 3.86% so this is just an overview of the Philip 20 portfolio uh, that we have constructed and before you get confused uh, how we sort of come up with this methodology I'll probably go through with you guys how I sort of uh, go through screening for stocks and the slight methodology behind uh, how we choose stocks uh, to be placed within this portfolio so an example over here is uh, I'll be using some power as an example. This is on a weekly time frame, and obviously some power is part of the portfolio as well. So as yes, you can see over here, some power is uh, this particular rule. So we have this particular trade uh, going back all the way to 30th March, and back then, based on our sort of uh, screening criteria, uh, the entry price back then at 30th March was around 82 and a half cents. So as of last Friday, uh, the close was 695. So for this particular counter, it's down 15%, really bad, but uh, just pre pretty much go through with you guys the rationale behind why we are still sort of uh, seeing long opportunities within some power. So to orientate you guys for the chart, uh, we use a lot of the moving averages. So the 20, uh, the red line over here is the 20 exponential moving average. Uh, the blue line over here is the 60 weekly moving average and the green dotted line is the 200 exponential moving average. So a general rule of thumb uh, I like to use is uh, to define an uptrend. Uh, we like to see the 20, the red line above the blue line, sort of uh, to tell us that we are in uptrend. And conversely, at the same time, we also like to use uh, higher highs and higher lows to sort of uh, mark uh, the uptrend progressing pretty nicely. 
So if we have conjunction of the 20 above the 60 moving average uh, together with the series of higher highs and higher lows making its move within the uptrend, uh, it tells us that we are transiting pretty nicely within the uptrend. And my methodology over here is we would like to sort of identify stocks that are moving very strongly in an uptrend and sort of identify when the correction will end. So to give you guys an idea of how we sort of uh, identify trading setups, you can see some power since 2015 has been moving pretty perfectly in an uptrend uh, from the low of around 15 cents to a high of 8, 8, 5 cents. So you can see I mark up the points over here, HH representing higher high and H low representing higher low. You can see how Sun Power follows this transition of higher highs and higher lows pretty nicely within an uptrend. And like I mentioned, once we sort of uh, establish an uptrend for a particular counter, we would like to latch onto it. And how we sort of uh, go about adding on to uptrending stock is uh, we wait for the pullback to happen. So you can see at this particular high high point, price started to correct. And what we want to see for the uptrend to continue is uh, usually when the uptrend remains strong and steady uh, is when we get the reversal around the 20 or 60 week moving average. So you can see over here, once prices start to correct, you can see the sort of a strong support level comes into play when uh, the 20 week moving average comes in and supports price. And once we get a bullish break above this blue pullback line, that by itself provides us the signal that the uptrend is still sort of intact and price is ready to go uh, ahead and make a new higher high. So you can see subsequent trade setup is pretty much the same over here. Uh, once price reach around this high of 40 cents, it enters into a correction and subsequently you can see the 20 week moving average once again acted as a strong support level to reverse this particular correction. And like I mentioned again, the confirmation for the uptrend uh, comes into play once we get a bullish break above this particular pullback line. So, uh, sorry about that. Uh, another example over here, again, you can see I've highlighted the shader box over here to show strong support of the 20 week moving average. So every single correction sort of gets halted pretty perfectly of the 20 week moving average. And then subsequently, you can see once price starts to break out above the pullback line, uh, price shows a good strong momentum that it's ready to hit into the next leg within the uptrend. So why we are still bullish on some power per se is because there was actually a strong run up in price since the start of this year uh, from a low of around 55 cents to a half 885 cents. But since then, around March period, uh, price went through some significant correction from 885 to a low of around 695 uh, as of last Friday's close. But what's interesting right now is you can see price is right now hanging around the 20 week moving average, pretty similar to what we have back in, in 2015 to 2016 period, whereby price is right now uh, hanging around the crucial level. So what is important right now uh, in order for this uptrend to sort of stay in play is uh, we would like to watch out for bullish price action starting to appear within the market for the 20 week moving average to sort of a whole price we need this uptrend. And what we want is for price to confirm that uptrend is still intact would be for the bullish price action to take out this particular pullback line over here. Uh, and once we get the confirmation that price breaks out of this pullback line, then there is a high chance that uh, we will see the next higher low point getting formed somewhere around here. And price should continue to move back within the uptrend to test the A35 to A5 resistance level. And so this by itself covers roughly how we go about forming our methodology. So just to recap again, first and foremost, the most important thing for us is uh, the portfolio is long only, hence we will be trying, uh, doing our best to identify strong uh, trending stocks. And once we identify a strong trending stocks, what we want to do is uh, sort of uh, to adopt the buy the dips kind of strategy to sort of identify pullbacks and to identify when the pullback will end. So like I mentioned again, uh, these are the few examples uh, that we use to sort of identify the end of the pullbacks by watching support of the moving averages as well as the bullish break of the pullback line. Yeah, so with that, that sort of covers the methodology as well as the introduction of our Philip 20 portfolio. So if you want to know more about uh, the 20 counter stocks that we have within this portfolio, uh, I highly recommend you to look out for our report that we released last Thursday. And within the report, we will give individual updates uh, on the most up-to-date view on how we see these 20 stocks performing right now and why we are still sort of a bullish uh, moving forward for them. And yeah, with that, I'll pass the rest of the time to Minsin to talk about Seng Xiong.
Morning everyone, uh, this is Lin Sin. So uh, just a brief update on uh, Sing Chong Group. So for the title for this quarter is that uh, no luck yet for new stores. So just to bring you guys through what was the uh, results for previous quarter in first queue. So as you can see that the top line was uh, mainly driven by the new stores growth, uh, which grew at 6.2%. Um, in particularly, the Yishun Junction 9 is, uh, perf is the best performing uh, stores. And uh, the remaining uh, new stores um, that was being pushed out in last year, 2016, um, some of it aren't doing as uh, good as expected. In particular, uh, the Loyang Point management note that uh, for the Loyang, Loyang Point uh, post renovation as a whole to the shopping mall is they have uh, been seeing lower footfall as compared to the post renovation. So it's uh, the whole uh, shopping mall as a uh, the shopping mall as a whole um, is being affected by the renovation. So they are. Um, they are hoping that uh, they will see some uh, footfall returning to uh, Loyang Point afterwards. And um, the temporary, this uh, headline is also, this headline is also affected by uh, the Loyang store uh, clo temporary closure in the sense that uh, it was closed in April 2016 and only reopened in end of Feb. So we are seeing two months uh, contribution uh, missing from the Loyang store. As for the same store sales growth, uh, it is quite flattish and uh, we have been seeing this trend of uh, flattish growth for, uh, few, for the past few quarters already. So moving forwards, uh, we continue to see that uh, the new stores would support um, the top line growth while the same store sales growth uh, would remain flattish. Moving on, uh, the next line will be on gross profit. And we see that margin has uh, improved on year-on-year -year basis, where it's at 25% uh, as compared to 24.5% a year ago. Um, although you may see that uh, there's a dip from uh, fourth quarter last year, which uh, locked at 26.3%. So this dip, um, it's not extraordinary where we usually see a lower contribution on uh, margin in the first quarter as well as the third quarter due to festive uh, season. So retailers usually will uh, lower their price in order to drive volume. So for the first quarter, you'll be seeing the Chinese New Year and the third quarter usually it will be the, on uh, the ghost, uh, Hungry Ghost Festival. Nonetheless, uh, we are expecting that uh, on the second quarter, gross margin should revert uh, to its high 25 to 26% uh, level. And uh, with that note also, um, we think that the margin expansion drivers uh, mainly coming from uh, lower input prices from supplier and uh, the benefits are gaining uh, from economic skills uh, due to bulk handling uh, remains intact and we expect that for the full year this year gross margin should maintain at about 26 percent and as we moved on uh, the most um, sorry let me backtrack uh, there are some things that uh, that um, has uh, caught our um, attention where there have been already uh, nine biddings going on since uh, third Q 2016 and uh, up to now where this all these nine biddings Seng Chong has not won any at all um, we are starting to become a uh, wary of these nine biddings, um, there are two being won by NTUC, one being by won by Giant, and the rest are by smaller market players, um, two by Angmo and uh, the other four by Ustar. And we note that, and we note that um, 
in last year, end of last year, we see that there's some irrational bidding where uh, there's prices being bid uh, by Yes Store as high as up to more than $20 per square feet, uh, which is a bidding at uh, the Tampanis Avenue. Nonetheless, uh, management also shared that um, they actually have uh, give up the tender and uh, this store should be up for bidding uh, soon. So uh, that aside, uh, we have been seeing some um, we have been seeing a more fractional bidding uh, in recent uh, bids where uh, the price bid was uh, around uh, 30 to 18 per, per square feet. So this is uh, something aligned with uh, what Seng Shiong is bidding as well. So we are putting hopes on uh, the second half of the year where there are six more uh, new supermarkets unit, unit will be uh, released for uh, bidding. And management actually shared that uh, there's one uh, bidding coming soon for open bidding coming soon for Woodlands, which would, um, which actually has a uh, 10k square feet and um, they do not expect that uh, the smaller market players uh, would, um, would uh, play a part in this uh, bidding game because of a larger sum of uh, rental uh, it being involved. So having said that, um, The management is also uh, cautiously optimistic on uh, the newly renovated and the bigger store at Tampanese Central. So Tem Tampani for Tampanese Central, um, they are still up for business, although that in the surroundings are undergoing uh, renovation work. So for Tampanese Central, um, it, they are going to move to a bigger store post uh, renovation work completes and um, is currently being affected uh, due to the renovation work and hopefully uh, post renovation works, um, it, they sh it should bring back more for, for and um, we, we may see uh, some positive uh, lift um, mirroring the positive impact uh, from Yishun Junction 9. So with that, uh, I would like to pass on uh, the presentation to Guangzi, who will talk about uh, SEMCOP marine results. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's go over uh, SEMCOP marine results. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, announced uh, their first Q results. So uh, our title is expecting target recovery. So we uh, upgraded our rating from reduced to neutral, and we maintain our target price. Since uh, this this last time price was uh, one dollar and sixty three cents, uh, was the price close price. Uh, the day after uh, San Marine's uh, first year results, which is uh, about two weeks ago. And recently, the price uh, actually recovered a bit from around uh, $1.60 to the current uh, around $1.80. The recovery was because uh, during the uh, uh, results of uh, Samco Industries, the CEO just that uh, the management will uh, do the strategic review for uh, Semcorp industry as well as uh, Semcorp Marine. So I think the market they expect uh, there will be some restructuring or uh, possible privatization or other um, refinancing for the Semcorp Marine. Now let's take a look at the results. Uh, the revenue uh, 
for the first queue decreased by uh, 17% to 760 million. Again, this was due to lower recon revenue recognition from the building segment, uh, which was resulted from uh, delivery, development, and lower repair business. And the gross profit dropped significantly uh, from 80, 80 million to only line around 20 million. So the decrease was due to uh, was mainly due to a floater project which is pending finalization with the customer. Actually, here uh, we 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 can make a guess that the the flow the floater project uh, the cost of the floater project was booked into PNL, while the revenue uh, has not booked in. And uh, let's take a look at the net profit. The net profit uh, dropped by around 30% to uh, 40 million. Uh, actually, this was mainly due to the uh, completion of divestment of 30% of equity interest in Costco, which uh, generated one off gain of uh, around 70, 47 million in first queue of this year. So uh, in the first queue, Semco Marine only secured uh, 75 million worth of new orders and most of these new orders are from uh, were from non-drilling segments, the offshore platforms and floaters. So uh, as of the March this year, the net order book uh, excluding repairs and upgrades, total uh, 7.1 billion and out of this 3.2 billion were belong to the SIP Brazil's project uh, which, uh, the, uh, which uh, the San Marine has not updated for the current pros progress of uh, the the Brazil's project. And here, uh, according to the management, the near shore gas infrastructure solutions uh, actually started to uh, improve since there were more inquiries for uh, these solutions. Uh, and also, uh, on the operational level, the management will continue to uh, conduct the ongoing reallocation and retaining of manpower. So uh, we expect that uh, San Marine this year will have a slow recovery and the recovery will, will be longer than expected since the profitability is um, subject to the shrinking of the order books. Uh, the next, I will hand over to Jeremy Tune to talk about DPS results. Hey, uh, hi, good morning. Um, Jeremy here to discuss the uh, DBS Group Holdings um, first Q 2017 results. Okay, so um, F, we, we have previously alluded to the um, flat net interest income in our first quarter um, sector report uh, owing to the unfavorable uh, 
known and read dynamics. So for DBS, uh, so far we are seeing that playing out. So you can see that the average rates on the customer non-trade loans have increased uh, six basis points quarter and quarter, but that has actually led to the um, uh, a very flattish loans growth, which uh, is very different from the uh, 2016, where you saw a much stronger loans growth. So we are seeing that kind of um, that kind of uh, uh, opposite movements between the rates and the volumes. So we, we see that um, coming from mainly the competitive corporate business segment, which accounts for, based on our estimation, 30% of the net interest income. And um, you can see also that the loan to deposit ratio is still on the higher side. But uh, taking from what the management's guidance in uh, fourth quarter 2016, uh, they are comfortable to actually push the LDR up to 90%. So if they were to do that moving forward, you might see some slight improvement on, on that, barring any uh, other um, volatile uh, rates and volume movements on the deposit side. So the next would be the coverage ratio. It has improved from 97% to 103%. Um, most importantly, I think from 103%, there's still a lot of work to do to move it up to um, the historical level of 130 so in, in my opinion, I think 103% is still very low. Uh, that's because you, you do not have enough buffer to actually um, offset some of the unexpected uh, uh, deterioration in the uh, loans books. So uh, as for now, the MPL ratio has stabilized, right? Uh, because most of the standard offshore operation, uh, standard vessels for the the offshore operations have um, are realizing values within that within that range, um, and also supported by some of the Indian uh, recoveries from some of the Indian NPLs. So the answers uh, moving forward, the uncertainty would lie uh, with the vessel vessels in the specialized operations, and that part will that part may actually, may actually um, uh, surprise on the downside moving ahead. So. Uh, Moving ahead, we think that the wealth management performance uh, could be a little bit more subdued because the first quarter 2017, it was a strong uh, performance there. And we also expect the general provisions to be higher uh, because we still believe that they will have to rebuild their coverage ratio. Okay, next will be uh, UOB. Okay, uh, UOB has shown um, a good improvement in its uh, net interest income on the quarter, quarter, and year on year. Uh, though we feel it's good, actually it's two percent only, but it is still uh, it is still quite respectable. Uh, we we believe that because the UOB is exercising some of pricing power onto the loans market, um, and it hasn't really compromised on the loans growth, uh, but it has uh, but it has slowed um, on a quarter basis. Uh, but it hasn't compromised in the sense that it, it has uh, deteriorated or it, it has um, not moved at all. It is it is still it is still marginal growth, uh, with despite the fact that they have exercised some of the pricing power. And um, the loan to deposit ratio is um, is also stable at eighty six point seven percent. And uh, we see that non-performing loans have inched higher because we. In, also, again, in our uh, our sector report in, in January, we have alluded that um, UOB could be actually moving uh, moving into higher risk in order to get higher returns. So we will expect a marginal uptick in the NPL, so while at the same time um, uh, uptick with in, in the net interest income. So uh, basically, we are seeing that um, playing out uh, in the first quarter 2017 results. So you can see that actually the MPLs associated to marine vessels have declined. So the MPLs are more towards the unsecured uh, side of the lending. So we, that could be owing to the SMEs as well as some of the uh, consumer loans. So finally, um, the last part is the total revenue growth was boosted by exceptional net trading income. So you can see that the uh, most of the delta is caused by uh, most of the delta to the net profit performance comes from the, this. Um, extra trading income, while the higher fees and commission income um, was actually offset by the higher staff and revenue related costs. 
so in this aspect, um, we we are less uh, we are less encouraged no? because uh, we are we are not seeing the the organic uh, operation the operations from this from its uh, core actually moving up or improving the bottom line. Okay, finally we have IFAS. Okay, so they have um, they have uh, shown a great improvement uh, in their um, total revenue. That's on the back of actually a, a much higher AUA uh, growth. Uh, two things. Uh, one is that it, there's an improved market sentiment that drove up valuations and sales growth. And second is that on the back of the launch of the FSF1 in December, we can see that from there there's um, improved channel sales from, from that new launch. Um, and also the bottom line has been boosted mainly in, in our opinion the um, lower staff costs. So we are saying that in 2016 you had um, a very, it was a, a tough operating environment for them because they were ramping up the staff costs to grow the business while the market sentiments have been weak. So the top line um, is uh, coming down while the cost side is going up and it caused a compression with the, on, the, on the profit margins. And um, so what's next? Uh, moving into the second quarter, uh, the trading on SGX listed stocks will be on track. Uh, they have very cleared, uh, cleared some uh, key system tests and are waiting for formal clearance from authorities. And uh, we are going to see a launch of stocks and ETF on its uh, B2C platform in April 2017 for the Hong Kong side. Okay, next we have the Singapore Reads. Uh, Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, this is Richard speaking. So this morning we published a sector report on industrial REITs. The title is uh, Business Parts Out High Tech Buildings In. Okay, this is the highlights for the industrial REITs. So, uh, okay, GTC recently published their sector data. So what we see in the sector data is that um, rent and occupancy were both lower in aggregate, uh, quarter on quarter and year on year. Going forward, we are expecting the sector's uh, rental reversions to range between negative high single digit to negative low double digits in the remainder of 2017. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we believe that rents are bottoming in 2017. We are going. To, we are emphasize that there's a difference between bottoming of rents and rental reversions. Uh, I'll explain that a bit more in one of the later slides. And in this uh, report, our key change to our view is uh, to switch from business park to high tech buildings. Again, I'll explain a bit further on the later slides. Overall, we are maintaining our equal weight uh, view on industrial REITs, same as last quarter, uh, with the same theme as well, optimism of bottoming of rents this year. Uh, the reason why it's equal weight and not overweight is because of the oversupply situation at the moment. So this table shows the data for first quarter 2017 from JTC. As with the other quarters, you can see most of the arrows are red, they're pointing down. Uh, notably, only the business part space uh, seems seems to have some positive in it. Uh, I know that that may be a bit contradictory to our view of uh, out with business part, but uh, Please bear with me and uh, you'll be explained in one of the later slides. So these are key takeaways from the quarter. Uh, as usual, I'll talk a bit about rental reversions for 
the quarter for the REITs that have announced their results. So uh, A REIT senders, they're still able to get positive with every rental reversion for their Singapore portfolio, 3.2%. Uh, however, within the Singapore portfolio, the logistics and distribution centers, which are warehouses, had a negative 19%. Capital DC REIT also had some positive from one uh, renewal at a marginally higher rate, and soy built REIT portfolio level was a positive 3.6%. Uh, Maple Tree Industrial was a casualty this time. Usually, they do not have a, they have not had negative reversions for the portfolio, but this quarter they had a minus 0.2% weighted average negative reversion, and this was weighed down by their stack up ramp up building segment. Uh, okay, so one of the reasons for why we are not so uh, optimistic on business park is that the price gap between business park and office is narrowing and what we think is uh, we should go for high-tech buildings for the growth factor and at the same time we maintain exposure in the conventional factory for stability so for um, the committee of the future economy they are projecting that Manufacturing will remain 20% of GDP over the medium term. It was a 19.6% for, for 2016. So with manufacturing being maintained at 20%, there's a few um, things to note. First, uh, there, there's a skill up strategy for manufacturing to uh, go up the value chain and that's where the high-tech buildings will come into play. And then at the same time, there are a lot of SMEs and the SMEs are the backbone of the manufacturing sector. The SMEs normally will go uh, towards a factory, they, they rent factory. So uh, that's why we are focusing on these two areas at the moment. This table shows our coverage. We currently cover four industrial REITs, uh, three neutral, one reduced. The next slides, I'll talk a little bit more on each of the individual industrial REITs. So firstly, cash, uh, no, no difference from the last few quarters, still the same thing that we're saying, uh, the high gearing. Now, the high gearing is at 43.1%. This would be an impediment to inorganic growth because, uh, as you know, the regulatory limits 45%. So as they reach 45%, they will need to either have some equity fund raising, which would be dilutive, or uh, they need to sell some of their properties in order to recycle the capital and buy new properties. So that was on inorganic growth. For organic growth, um, there's limited scope for growth in gross revenue due to the oversupply situation now, uh, but there's some mitigating factor in that only 4.7% of the expiry uh, by gross rental income in 2017. The other thing that they have uh, going for them in a negative sense is their Rental dispute with Schenker at 51 Elms Avenue that remains unresolved. Uh, going forward, 2018, they have a master lease expiry with CWT Commodity Hub. Next is uh, Capital DC. Uh, so we're expecting revenue growth this year uh, and 7.7% high, higher DPU for FY17. This is driven by their acquisitions. So they did two last year and one in January 2017. The recent one in January was the 90% interest in the Singapore data center that was sold from the sponsor. So our forecast is um, 
here, 6.61 cents and 6.04 cents for FY17 and FY18. The point to note about why we have a lower DPU for FY18 is um, because of because we have assumed an equity fund raising in the third quarter of FY18 that's in conjunction with the acquisition of the main cubes data center in Germany. And with that equity fund raising, the weighted average unit base would increase. Currently, our estimate is 2.8% increase in the weighted average for over FY18 and FY17. Maple Tree Industrial Trust, this has a clear path for growth through high-tech buildings. Uh, we see that for they've had steady addition of high-tech buildings to their portfolio. Um, as of fourth quarter of FY14, it contributed 13% of their net property income. And over the three years, uh, fast forward to FY17, fourth quarter, uh, high-tech building segment was already contributing 25% of their portfolios net property income. So you can see that they are uh, growing this segment and it's taking a larger share of their portfolio. Going forward for their high-tech buildings pipeline, we have three. One is the phase two of the Hewlett Packard built to suit and they'll be completing this quarter. The other one is the 38 Kalang Place AEI where they're redeveloping one of their existing properties is they're building a high-tech building at what was a open-air car park. This should be completed in the first quarter of 2018. The other one is, uh, you may recall, uh, last month they have signed um, a project to develop a built-to-suit data center and this will also be completed in the uh, second half of 2018. So there's, you can see that they have a track record of building up the high-tech buildings and they still have a pipeline of the buildings coming in. Now, uh, in terms of valuation wise, we believe that the uh, growth potential is already priced in. The price to book is about 1.3 or high 1.2s and um, we'll we are sticking with our call to say that uh, look to accumulate on temporary price weakness for Maple Tree Industrial Trust. For soy build, uh, the drag is coming from the weaker and expected take up rate at Loyang Way property. So as a reminder, this property was uh, tenanted to Technics Offshore, but the tenant has uh, defaulted on the rent. So the REIT has been drawing down on the security deposit. And the security deposit is deep soon it will be depleted uh, sometime in the middle of May this year so that's following that um, the full effect of the lower occupancy will start to appear in their uh, results and why I say this the weakened and expected take up rate so as we have reported in the last few quarters of our uh, results uh, results reports Management was actually actively trying to find new tenants uh, and they were looking at about 60% occupancy. However, in the most recent quarter, uh, management shared that they have only managed to secure about 9%, 9 or 10% uh, of the property for new tenants. So that's where uh, the weaker than expected take up rate has uh, materialized. And then we have uh, cut our DPU for that as well. And going for the remainder of this year, uh, DPU will be weighed down by a higher unit base because of the preferential offering that was done last year. So we're expecting lower year on year DPU for all four quarters of FY17 for soybean REIT. Okay, this chart shows the occupancy and rental index for the whole industrial sector. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it, just that you can see that uh, rent 
is actually going down. And if you compare year on year, it's down. And uh, if you compare three years ago, which will give you a sense of the rental reversions, then you can see that the um, new rent that is ongoing now is actually lower than three years ago. This for factory, roughly the same uh, shape of the graph, also the same as, a, uh, as the entire sector, so we won't spend so much time here. Uh, the other one is um, business park. Okay, business park, if you look at this here, this uh, rent here has been going sideways for the last uh, uh, seven quarters or so, that's almost for the last two years. Um, during that time, occupancy has actually come down. The reason for the low occupancy is actually because of new properties coming in and now occupancy is going up again. But if you notice, um, rent isn't going up and so this is one of the things that uh, has one of the factors where we are not so optimistic on business park anymore even though um, there's not much new supply. Uh, I'll go into more details into that later on. Uh, warehouse, same as almost the overall sector. You can see the rent level is also going down. Uh, and one of the differences is that where uh, occupancy is creeping up slowly. Okay, this is the shows the supply pipeline um, for the next few years, 2017, 18, 19, and the uh, uh, Pipeline for factory, warehouse, and business park. So you can see here that uh, it's actually tapering off already from FY18. In FY18, there's uh, 1.1 million square meters, and this uh, 1.1 is actually uh, lower than the historical average supply. Okay, now uh, I'd like to talk about this. Uh, single user factory here. So single user factory, this chart shows uh, the blue bars are showing what has come out, um, the new supply that has come out during the first quarter and the orange bar shows the the forecasted supply coming out uh, in second, third and fourth quarter of this year. So for single user factory, you can see that this amount came out in the first quarter and there's going to be a disproportionately large amount of supply coming out in the remainder of the year relative to this first quarter. So there could be some negative impact from this um, where users from the other properties move into their, sing into their single user property here. Same as always, um, neg negligible new supply of business park space for the remainder of 2017. This uh, chart shows in terms of percentages, the percentage increase of new supply uh, with the reference point of being the first quarter of 2017. So for the remainder of 2017, it will add on about 4.3% compared to current and FY18, 2.4 and so forth. So again, uh, you can see uh, planned new supplies tapering off already. Uh, okay, and I mentioned about the three-year average annual supply and demand is uh, 1.8 and 1.3 million square meters respectively. So just now I said that uh, this this year there will be 1.1 million square meters coming online, and uh, that's lower than the past supply of uh, 1.8. Okay, so there has been an uptick in industrial activity and we believe this signals an improvement in the global economy. So for Singapore, PMI has remained in expansionary territory uh, in tandem with industrial production. You can see that since uh, last year, both of them have been going up um, and industrial production has peaked in 20, December 2016. That's this, this uh, data point here. So going forward, we expect the PMI and industrial production to converge to a more sustainable level for continued growth. Uh, we don't expect it to be able to uh, maintain this level here and here as well. 
Okay, the other thing, uh, Singapore being a net exporter, we, we believe that the high industrial output has been a reflection of improving global economic sentiment and that has, uh, that has the effect of driving external demand. So we have uh, plotted the OECD leading indicator and it shows that uh, the three largest economic blocks had actually bottomed up in terms of their um, forward sentiment indicator here. Okay, for the outlook for Singapore industrial property, uh, no surprise here, continued pressure to, due to mismatch in supply and demand. Uh, JTC expects 2 million square meters of new space coming out in the window of 2017. This is about 4.3% of existing stock. Uh, I've said in one of the previous slides, so um, new space coming out is higher than average supply and the histor historical demand is actually only 1.3 million. Uh, Rental reversions this quarter was a negative double digit and uh, we expect it to continue that way, either at negative high single digit or negative low double digit for the remainder of 2017. Oversupply in multi-user factory space. So for 2017, there's actually 549,000 square meters plan and this is actually 134% more than the new supply that came out in 2016. So you can see that there's a lot of new supply coming out for a factory space and this would add actually 5.2% of stock as of the end of 2016 uh, compared to the 2.2% that was added between 2015 and 2016. So for this we are expecting a negative double digit reversions for middle of 2017. Uh, warehouse site supply pressure also, uh, the planned supply is 942,000 square meters and this is 61% higher than the net new supply in 2016. This will add 10% to existing stock uh, compared to the 6.6% added in 2016. Okay, so we are saying that there's a stale thesis on business parts. Um, yes, no doubt there's limited supply, but prices aren't, uh, prices aren't going up. This is due to the narrow price gap with the office rents. So um, business park and offices are uh, substitute goods. And so if the office rents are coming down, the business park rents actually can't can't really go up. If you look here, uh, this blue line shows the median office rent in dollars per square foot per month and this is showing the business park median rent also in dollar per square foot per month and this this line just shows the difference between the two. So at this point here, um, when there was uh, the start of the oversupply of office space came in, um, the price, the median price, the median rent uh, for office actually dropped and then that's and you can see that this is where the, the price differential has narrowed and so this is why uh, we think uh, business park rents are not going up higher because um, with the new supply of office space uh, there will be an easing of office rent and in order to stay com competitive uh, the business park uh, rent will actually have to uh, uh, stay low as well and maintain this gap that you see in the price. Otherwise, um, there's not much incentive for the tenants to want to move to a business park if 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 the gap actually um, narrows. So for strategic top-down view, uh, we remain equal weight on industrial REITs. Uh, subsector on optimism of bottoming of rents. Uh, while we expect the supply and, and demand imbalance to persist, but we already see some stabilization of asking rents. Um, 
So this part here, bottom up view, switch out of business park space to high tech assets. We think that the high tech assets will have a better growth prospect compared to business parks. And for that, uh, Maple Tree Industrial Trust is our preferred choice. As I explained in one of the earlier slides, there's a track record of growing the business, growing the high tech building segment, and there's also a visible pipeline of new high tech buildings for Maple Tree Industrial. This shows the quarterly summary of results for all the industrial REITs. Note that there's no data for Savannah REIT as uh, their results was has been delayed due to their EGM. So broadly, uh, same as every other quarter, uh, cross rental growth is driven you know, mainly by inorganic growth and some organic growth. So for uh, inorganic growth is through acquisitions and this was at Ascenders, Maple Tree Logistics, Cash, Capital DC and Viva. Uh, Maple Tree Industrial completed their build to suit project and uh, for AEIs, this, there were some AEIs that were completed at uh, Maple Tree Lock and AIMS AMP Capital Industrial REIT. Broadly, in situations where DPU were uh, lower year on year. This was mainly due to uh, convergence within the portfolio from single user asset to multi tenanted building. This specifically is at Cash and Cambridge Industrial Trust. Uh, for soy build read, there was a 1 for 10 preferential offering last year and so there was dilution uh, in the recent quarter. This for the full year results, there were four of the REITs that had their full year results in March as uh, AIMS AMP, Ascenders, Maple Tree Industrial and Maple Tree Lock. Uh, same as previous slide, so I won't waste too much time about uh, the source of growth for their revenue. And for their DPU, it was uh, roughly in line in the same direction as cross revenue. So nothing much to Talk here. Uh, this chart shows the performance measures across the industrial REITs. So it's occupancy, weighted average lease expiry by gross rental income, by net letable area, uh, their gearing, weighted average debt maturity, weighted average cost of debt, and their interest coverage. Uh, this chart shows a snapshot of the current valuation in terms of uh, price price to book and their trailing yield. Again, no data shown for Sabana as the results have been delayed. These are uh, four, these are uh, three, three tables behind uh, are what we showed in the last few quarters. You can see that um, in terms of the yield, the yield has been compressing for the industrial REITs and likewise the uh, price to book has actually gotten uh, more expensive <coughs> across the <laughs> across the last few quarters. The okay, last slide, uh, this is just the bubble chart, show the relative position of the various reads uh, among themselves. As usual, the four largest market capitalized REITs, which are Ascenders, Maple Tree Industrial, Maple Tree Lock, and Capital DC, they are found at the bottom right corner of this chart. Uh, the market is willing to pay a premium. You can see that uh, around this point here, is their um, price to work is about more than 1.2 and even up to more than 1.3 in the case of Capital DC. So, uh, not much change in position uh, if you compare the left chart and the right chart from one quarter ago. Uh, you will not see Sabana in this uh, chart as well for the same reason as previous page. Okay, we have come to the end of the webinar. We will pause now for questions.
Hi Jeremy speaking here. Uh, there's a question asking regarding the technical files, uh, whether we take into consideration volume as well as fundamental. Uh, for the fact, uh, technical files uh, don't really take much consideration about the fundamentals of the stock. Uh, it's mainly focused on the technicals. And as for volume, yes, uh, it plays a very huge importance in terms of determining whether we take a trade or not. So to reiterate again for technical files, it's mainly based on technical rather than fundamentals. And yes, definitely volume is uh, one big part of the analysis framework within the uh, technical analysis uh, for the technical files. Uh, and how do you get hold uh, on the technical files B20 portfolio? Uh, it can be found on the uh, volumes research tab. Uh, we published that on last Thursday for the full report of the Philip 20 portfolio. Uh, and if you just want to follow our day-to-day -day movement updates on uh, trading ideas, uh, we do publish them on a daily basis on the poems. So the portfolio will be listed on the second page of the technical pulse report uh, on a daily basis. And on the first page, there will be just uh, new daily trading ideas uh, that we post and identify on a daily basis. Hi, there's a question on uh, the investment in China by Xingxiong. So um, they have announced that they are, they are going to, um, oh, sorry, let me backtrack. Um, so the opening of the Xingxiong store in China, uh, JV, uh, which should be on track uh, to open by um, end of this year. But uh, given that um, it's their first foray into um, China, it would take uh, at least um, one to two years uh, to break even. So for these two years, uh, we do not see there's any uh, significant uh, contribution coming from this store. And the other question is that, uh, does the assumption that entire price assume uh, zero new stores opening in uh, this year as well as for next year. For this year, uh, okay, uh, our target price and assumption is actually uh, based on um, FI 2017 uh, forecasted earnings and uh, the forward PE, forward PE uh, for 2017 as well. So as for as for 2018, uh, Yes, uh, we have uh, also taken into account of uh, the new source, but our tire price is actually mainly based on 2017. Uh, there's a question regarding the takeover by HN. A uh, takeover by HNA of CWT in relation to Cash Logistics Trust. Um, that the question is actually addressed in the most recent report that we published for Cash. So uh, please take a look at that report.
uh, yes, we have a question on whether is that upside for UOV target price. I think that is a um, question of how it's able to um, exercise pricing power into the markets without compromising loans growth. Um, but as you can see that uh, as they increase the revenue line, the expense line has also gone up. So uh, that portion we have to monitor a little bit carefully is nonetheless a still a very competitive uh, business environment. So um, I think that the most of the price movement up is because of its um, its lower exposure to the offshore and oil, uh, offshore oil and gas as compared to its peers. So uh, I think that it's already been priced in already. Okay, thank you. If there's uh, no further question, uh, we shall end our webinar for today. Thank you for tuning in and uh, we hope to see you again uh, next week. Thank you.